Good afternoon, students. And so today I'm going to be talking about how to do your worksheet, the Week 10 Credible Sources Worksheet. So this is going to be a pretty long lecture. Hey, Anil, how are you doing? Um, we only have two more of these lectures left, this one, then number 11 and 12. So I'm going to start right away because this is a really long lecture. And I'm going to be talking about how to do the Week 10 Credible Worksheet Credible Sources Worksheet. So many students are already confused about it, which I already knew that was going to happen. So here we go. So first I'm going to go over um, what is APA, how to do the Week 10 Credible Sources Assignment. Then I'm going to go over the Week 11 Forum. Then I'm going to go over different types of credible sources, different types of non-credible sources, using Kapow to evaluate for credible sources, how to avoid fallacies and different kinds of fallacies. During the week nine presentation, we talked about argumentation. We learned about ethos, pathos, and logos to make a good argument, that you need all three appeals to avoid fallacies. If you are missing any of these appeals, you have a fallacy. You always need a claim with credible evidence to avoid fallacies. This week, we will learn how to evaluate and find credible sources to our claim to avoid fallacies. We will learn about kapow and crap as ways to avoid everything's about fallacies, as well as learning different kinds of credible and non-credible sources. Here's some examples of excellent persuasive essays from the Week 9 Forum from past classes. Should healthcare workers be required to be vaccinated against COVID-19 or lose their jobs? There's no doubt about it, COVID-19 has caused a devastating pandemic affecting countless lives around the globe. Healthcare workers have personally witnessed and experienced the havoc brought about by this virus. And so here you have the thesis statement, healthcare workers shouldn't be forced to take the COVID-19 vaccine because it's experimental, it compromises freedom, and there are other protections in place. And so she, she has very good Healthcare workers shouldn't be um, vaccinated, forced to vaccinate because it's still experimental. And then here she made good use of her APA because she's talking about a medical fact and here you have author and date. So when you have an APA direct quote, you have to have quotation marks and you have to have the author and you have to have the date. So on your week 10 worksheet, the very first thing you're going to be doing uh, is you're going to be doing a direct quote. So this is how you do a direct quote. You take a sentence from the article and then you write the uh, article author name and date. You don't have to place it inside a paragraph. All, all you have to do is just have the direct quote. Another reason why healthcare workers shouldn't be forced to take the COVID-19 vaccine is freedom. And lastly, uh, healthcare workers shouldn't be forced to take the vaccine because they have other forms of protection against the virus. Notice how I'm only reading the first sentence of every paragraph, and that's, uh, that, that's because I'm going through the main idea of the essay. It's called skimming. And so here you have essay two. Um, here he took, somebody took the opposite point of view. Times are tough in the world that we live today. Fears rule our thoughts and actions. There are a lot of similarities between today and the 1918 pandemic, but there are also a lot of differences. Here, the person forgot to cite historical facts. And so here she has to put in, if you're using dates, you have to put in um, the author and the date. And then here she's like, I believe that we should all get the vaccine because the science is not new. It will help us create immunity and it will help life get back to normal. So the previous student was against it, a vaccination and this one is for vaccination. And so here the science behind the vaccine actually started back in 2002 when the SARS epidemic happened. Once again she's missing her in-text citation. So what do we what do we what do we write in a, in a direct quote? When we have a um, when we have a direct quote we put in quotation marks here and then we put in the author's name, and then we put in the date, and then we put in a page number if it's available. If there is no author name, we put in the website name. Okay, website name, and then the date. 
if there's no date or website or or, or uh, if there's no author or date you put in the website name and you put in ND okay and so either way when you have a historical fact or a medical fact you need to cite your source and that is a here is another one when we were children our parents got us vaccinated like m m measles mumps rubella tetanus this is a list that has changed since past generations because the disease they were they were vaccinating for has been eradicated uh, so since she's talking about her personal life that does not need okay that's it the instances of the flu and common cold were way down last year as opposed to this year's pre-COVID. And so here she's talking statistics. So she needs to cite her medical facts. And here you need uh, author and then you need date. And that's it, okay? In conclusion, I think the vaccine is something that should be required for us to get. And so we repeat the, we repeat the um, uh, thesis statement again in the... Um, in the conclusion. So those were the mistakes, the most common mistakes in the week nine forum is not citing, people not citing their historical facts, people not, some people didn't cite anything in their entire post. And so here are some common reference citation errors in which students just gave me their website names. This we went over last week. And so you know that when you do your reference citations, you need to put in the you need to put in the author name, name, you need to put in the date, you need to put in the article name, then you need to put in publication or website name. This is also on this week's worksheet. And then retrieved, retrieved today's date from, then you put in your website name last. And so on today's worksheet, uh, after you do your in-text citation, after you do the direct quote in which you cite the um, today's, cite the uh, source, and then you summarize the source, then you're going to have, those are known as in-text citations, and then at the very end of the worksheet, you're going to have your reference citation. A reference citation comes at the end of your paper, and so you, you put in references, and it becomes an alphabetical list, and so don't just give me a bunch of of web web addresses so that's that's basically um, so do you know anybody who would make these kind of mistakes Anil? Yes me. <laughs> so this I show this because these are all from previous students and I created this this file I guess uh, I don't know several several months ago so as you could see you're not alone in thinking that this is the only way in which one does um, their reference citations. At the very beginning of the reference uh, worksheet, you can just put in the website name, the, the website address. But at the very end of the source, you have to put in the reference citation. So here is a correct example. Here you have the author name, then you have the date, then you have the name of the article, births, final data for 2019. Then you have the publication name, which is National Vital Statistics Journal, I left that out, or reports, volume 70, number two, and then, then the name of the website, Centers for Disease Control. So this is obviously for a journal that is online. So if you're getting your source from an online journal, then you need to put in the name of the journal, the volume, the number, then the website name, then the date you retrieved it, and then the website address. Is that clear? So if we're using a book instead of... Uh... A website, do you still need retrieved date? No, no, you don't need to write the, the date retrieved. Then it, then it would just end with uh, publication. So if I had a book, so if I had a book, okay, it would be Smith P, somebody's name, and then 2002, name of book is obesity, all right? And then I'm going to have to, well, most people have a longer, longer, what you call it, and just obesity. Uh, and then you're going to have, uh, I have to go back to, let's see, how do you go back to it? Ah. All right, then you're going to have publication names. So I would say uh, McGraw, McGraw Hill, McGraw Hill Publications. And that pretty much, that pretty much, uh, oh, page 22 to 25, something like that. 
So if you have a book, it's very much shorter. You don't need to have, of course, this is a book, physical book. If you're getting an online book, okay, this is for a physical book, like it's mm -hmm. sitting on your desk, physical book. But if you have an online book, then you have to have, um, let's see, it's almost the same here. So if it's an online book, then it's very similar to a website. Okay, so if it's an online book, then you have to have all of this, and then you're gonna have- uh, Retrieved from. Yes, yeah. correct. Retrieved, uh, what's today's date? Whatever today's date is, mm -hmm. from whatever the address is. So an uh, online book is similar. It's, it's like a, a cross between website and book, you see. And so um, here, and you don't need to write in physical book. You don't need to write, although the older versions of um, APA, people used to write print like that. So when you look at articles and you see that word print at the end of somebody's reference citation, you know that that's an older version of APA. Uh, I think it's 2009. Now you don't have to put in print anymore. You just put it like that because people realize if you don't have retrieved today's date from web address, web address it's a obviously it's physical, you see. So uh, these days you don't have to do that. Um, but you're going to still see it on other people's research, older research papers. Here's another example of a, I think this is an online journal of the time. Yes, it is. So you got the author's name, the date, and you always italicize the name. And then here you have the name of the journal, and also the name of the journal could be italicized. And then you have 27, that depends on the, and then retrieved uh, the, from, and then that sort of thing. So you, you get the idea. In this case, notice how there's no, no author name. So she used the website name. She wrote out the website name or the, the uh, yeah. So the website name was the same thing as her article name in this case. All of this is the same. And then because she had no, no, no author, no, so you write, you do, you use whatever you have and then retrieve a date and then web, web address. So don't just have, give me the web address, which is what some, a lot of people do. So these are all examples. Uh, here I, I couldn't figure out if this is this someone's title, but actually it was someone's name. Can you believe that someone's name program? Uh, I don't know. And here you have um, you have no no um, author, so I think she's missing her website name in the beginning. You know, you should have a website name, but this is missing a website name. Yeah. So if there's no author, you put in the website name. The website name does not need to be italicized, so you could go like that. It's only the this part that's italicized. And here you have people making one minor mistake. More, oh yeah, here it is. So she wrote environmental program benefits. So what mistake does she make? You have to, ita you have to capitalize, capitalize, you have to capitalize your, uh, your no, titles. Yeah. So uh, I'm sure that when I correct all of this, and then they're gonna, oh, it doesn't really matter. And so this student made the same mistake. I think I corrected it when I was teaching another student, but here these were not italicized. Uh, you don't have to italicize small words like but, and, is, of. Prepositional phrases don't have to be italicized, but everything else has to be italicized. See, on doesn't have to be italicized. And so here you have more, um, whatchamacallit, um, examples. And here you have an example of an in-text citation where somebody writes in um, her too many, too many um, facts all at the same time. But she did a good job in putting in her, obviously there was no author name, so she put in a uh, website name and then the, the date, okay? And so here she has, and the, these people have correct citations. You have the author's name, the date, then you have the name of the, here you have a mistake. What's, what's wrong with her uh, title? So there's no capitalization? Exactly. So she forgot, this person forgot to put in world and then population, you know, population. And you even for now, even that becomes, you know, online. And then do we write out 60% like this in a title? It doesn't look right. So it, here you could put in 60% of the mm -hmm. world population. It just looks better that way. Anyway, so remember that your in-text citations needs to match your reference citation. So in this particular person's paper, if I see a reference citation, this is for your final draft. 
So if I see a reference citation that says camp, then I expect to see an in-text citation that says camp. So in the week nine uh, forum, I saw a lot of people who just put in references, and then there's no in-text citations. So I don't know which fact she's talking about or which fact she's referring to. So when you have a reference citation, you have to have a matching in-text citation. If you have three reference citations, you need to have three in-text citations inside your paper that matches the reference citation. So just having your reference citation at the end of your paper is not good enough. And so a lot of people did not bother. They just put the reference citation at the end. And then I'm like, OK, so which fact is she talking about? Is it the statistical fact? Is it that medical fact? And you don't know which is which. So if you're a reader or a researcher and you want to research more into a specific fact, you don't know where to go. It's, not, it's too vague. Um, here is uh, someone's paper. We're not going to read it, but we're going to ask the question, where are his in-text citations? Does this person have any in-text citations to speak of? To some, golf is seen as a glorified hobby. It is a game that you play on the weekends with your friends and family. But to many others, this is a worldwide sport. Although golf does not require brutal strength, the athletes that play this uh, sport have incredible physical conditioning, are extremely competitive, and have incredible mental strength. So this person has an excellent thesis statement with excellent parallel structure. Adjective noun, adjective noun, adjective noun. Very good. She also has a matching uh, topic sentence. First, you need to be in good physical condition, incredible physical conditioning. And so she has her, the golf, the World Golf Foundation estimates that golfers walking an 18-hole uh, block a clock about five miles and burn up to 2,000 calories. So she remembered to put in her source. She remembered to put in her quotation marks. What else is missing? So we need the author's name and the year. Yeah, the author's name, Smith, and the year. Okay, and so that's that's missing. But she did know that she did know it was some kind of quotation. Okay, so she almost got it. So this person, I don't know if this is from this this class or not. Some golf, top golfers can reach a swing speed at over 100 miles an hour. What's missing over here? Any kind of numbers, uh, you have to cite it. So once again, this person is missing. Okay, Smith, 2002, and then. It's unclear if this is a um, paraphrase or if this is a cited source. So if, if you're unsure, you always just assume that the person cited it directly. And so here, this is, so that sort of thing. So whenever you have any kind of numbers, any kind of uh, five miles, 2,000 calories, 18 whole, someone had to do research and you need to put it in the, uh, uh, so this person forgot to put in the ability to stay focused. Day after day uh, requires e extreme mental strain. How does she know that? This, didn't somebody have to do research that this is a medical fact, and this also requires some kind of uh, so medical facts, um, numbers, all of this requires. So, and then this is what I got at the very end. Okay, just this. So somebody forgot to put in sources or references. You don't put in uh, sources. You put in sources you could put in for, for MLA, but not for APA. And then this person is missing what? What are the parts of the reference citation he's missing? So we need the author. Author name. And the title of the article. Well, date. Then the title of the article. Uh, if there's a publication and page number. And website, uh, name. website name or publication and page number. Then what? What else? Uh, retrieved from this website. Excellent. So retrieved from, uh, and retrieved date. from the retrieved. Oh yes, today's date. Retrieved yeah. uh, March. What is today's date? The Ides of the Ides of March. Today sixteenth. Yep. Today is the sixteenth. The Ides of March. Okay, mm -hmm. I think that was yesterday. Anyway, it's the day that Brutus killed Caesar. Yeah. Anyway, so author, date, title of article. If you're a, if you're a literature major, you know that. Um, so that's what this, this is very, that's why it's very common. What you did was very, very common and people missing in-text citations. And so here, same thing, 
all Americans. I believe this comes from somebody from this this uh, this 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 um, quarter. Think okay. all Americans should have the right to health care. Health care will help the people be more healthier. Do we say more healthy, or do we say more more healthier, or do we say more healthy? Well, we can either say healthier or more healthy. Either way would be good, but not more healthier. That's kind of redundant. Yes, so more healthy. By having health care, and so here you have a introductory phrase. Mm -hmm. it, well, yeah, you got to have a comment. It will stop the spread of sickness. The people who suffer mental sickness or and are depressed will get more help. They will get more of the help they need. Medications will be cheaper for people to get. It will also stop people from going to the hospital. So this is her very long thesis statement, okay? She could have done it uh, much shorter. So this is an example of where you can put all of these simple sentences together into one sentence, okay? So this has uh, got to do with um, sentence variety. Health, everyone should have a right to health care, should have the right to free health care, health care because and then then and then it would be uh, stop because free health care would stop spread of sickness then you put in a semicolon would end mental illness and would stop people from going to ER for non-emergency reasons okay i misspelled emergency emergency reasons or something like that yeah. so you notice how i use a semicolon semicolon and a semicolon in order to merge all of these simple sentences into one thesis statement then when you write your paper you don't need to write out just your whole thesis statement as your introduction you can write a five sentence story like a case study darlene is poor Darlene uh, does not have health insurance. She works part-time at a bookstore. She cannot afford to get her medication for her children. She cannot get afford to her, her grandmother to go to health care for regular checkups. So people like Darlene need free health care. Then you segue into your thesis statement and write, everyone should have the right to free health care. So you can use uh, either use a, a somebody's um, case study or uh, you could use a turnabout. In other words, mention the other side. Okay, this is what I meant about engaging the uh, opposition. You could get rid of all of this, all right, and then you could write, uh, many people think that free health care um, is like welfare and that uh, people should pay their own way and that taxpayers should not have to pay for other people's health. Some people think that will make people too dependent on others or something, something, something. However, and then you pivot over into uh, everyone should have free health care because it would stop the spread of sickness, it would end mental illness, and it would stop people from going to ER for non-emergency reasons. So you can have a introduction paragraph with a case study or engaging the opposition. And so later on in this presentation, I'm going to talk about how engaging the opposition helps you have a fair and non-biased paper. So this is an example of how you can do that. The rest of it she did right. She has matching um, topic sentences, but where are her in-text citations? Do we, since she's talking a lot of medical facts, she should have at least one in-text citation at the end of her uh, at the end of her paragraph. So we know that she got all of this from such and such a source, okay? If her whole paragraph is a paraphrase, especially if the whole paragraph is a paraphrase from something that she read, then we need to know what it is that she's paraphrasing. So here it could be, she could have read this in Jones. Notice how I have Smith and Jones in this paper. So when I go to sources, I expect to see something Jones in a reference citation, and I expect to see Smith and reference citation. So this is what I mean by saying that your reference citations need to match your sources, okay? So I expect to see uh, Jones and Smith up here, and I expect to see Jones and Smith down here, not just simply Jones and Smith only. And so um, I know I'm going too fast. Am I going too fast? And she made no, it's okay. 
she made good use of transitions, okay? It's just everyone is weak on still their APA because the second half of this class is teaching APA. So now I'm going to segue into APA. When do we use APA in text citations? APA stands for American Psychological Association. And APA is used in social science research and business research papers. We use APA when we cite medical facts, historical facts, numbers, statistics, percentages, complex facts, unusual facts, anything that is not common knowledge in American society. So an example of common knowledge in American society is December 25th is Christmas Day. December 24th is Christmas Eve. And so in America, you don't need to cite it. Although if you're writing in China and they're not really, they don't really celebrate Christmas, you will have to cite the source because they're not, they're, how, how did you know that? Where did you get that information from? So if I were to say the Chinese New Year is based on the lunar calendar, then you have to write the author, date, and page number. Now if I were to write this in Chinese, wouldn't that sound ridiculous when you consider that Chinese New Year is a major holiday like Christmas is here? You would think everybody would know that. Why would you need to cite the source? It becomes a duh, like, you know, we just crawl out from under a rock, you know, from that country. So for, so for us, we need to cite the source because for us, Americans, that's uncommon knowledge. So, so uncommon knowledge can also be, you know, um, so when, you all, when people wrote their uh, persuasive essays, some people were missing their in-text citations. And so when you have medical facts, historical facts, this is, this is worth repeating because people forget. And so here, if you're watching this video, you should stop the video here and take notes and write down medical facts, historical facts, dates, percentages, statistics, numbers, definitions, uncommon knowledge, any kind of uncommon, uncommon knowledge that uh, did you know that uh, such and such an animal has eight uh, fingers and three uh, eight, three eyes or something really strange anything strange and unusual also or controversial if you were to say something controversial like for instance did you know climate change is really a hoax anything controversial you also have to cite the source because people are, are going to go did you just make that up so you have to cite controversial knowledge as well Something that people people will go, no, no way, that's not the way I understand. That, I was taught something different um, uh, and stuff like that. So that's when we cite the source. So when we use in-text citations, so in-text citations occur inside the body of the paper. Reference citation uh, is listed at the end of the paper. And so when we write in-text citations, we have two kinds of in-text citations. We have a direct quote and a paraphrase quote. In a direct quote, you have to you cite exactly what word per word what the site says. And so here, marijuana lessens the effect of chemotherapy. Then you have to have the author, the date, and the page number. In this case, there was no author, so he, she put in CDC and 2021. And then when she, you want to paraphrase this, you would say marijuana lessens the effect I mean, makes the side effects of chemotherapy less severe. So I simply said it in my own words, uh, this particular direct quote, I said it in my own words, and that's known as a paraphrase quote, and this you have author 2020. And then at the very end of your source, then you write in the reference citation of what exactly is Smith Patrick. If I were to write in here, Smith 2020, 22. So let's get rid of, for example, let's get rid of this for a second. And I wrote in, where did, where did the other one go to? Oh, Smith 2020 should be 2022, but you get the idea, 2022. Then you have to have Smith Patrick, which matches benefits of marijuana, American Medical Journal retrieved. So this is, I did this particular um, lecture June 16, 2021. So that's when I typed this out. That's how you could tell because it's the date uh, from WWAMA. All right. And then when, when I ask about the um, why is this source credible? So that's also on your worksheet. Then yes. you have to say this article is credible. Credible. So we're going to use Kapow. C stands for currency. A stands for author. P stands for purpose. O stands for objective, 
and W stands for writing purpose. And so we use the Kapow acronym in order to evaluate whether or not a source is credible or not. So here, uh, with the question, why is your source credible, you would say, C, my, my Smith article is credible because it was published in 2020, wasn't published 10 years ago. So any article more than 10 years old is too old. Then A, author, who wrote the article? Was it written by an actor, an athlete, a politician, or a scientist? And, and so you would say, it was written by an expert, Dr. Smith, so therefore it's credible. P means for purpose. Was the purpose for education? Was the purpose for entertainment? Was the purpose to sell you a product, like an advert? And so uh, if the purpose is an advert, then advertisement, okay, in, in British talk is advert, in English, advertisement, if it's an ad, then it's not credible. Okay, so you have to prove that the purpose is educational, informational, and therefore it's credible, that it's not an ad. So that's purpose. Objective. Objective means, is it biased? Does it talk about both sides? Is it fair and balanced? Do they, do they have any fallacies of cherry picking? Or is it factual or does someone just make it up off the top of their head? Is it fictional or non-fictional? And so it is objective because it talks about medicine. It comes, it is factual because it comes from cdc.gov and it's one of those .gov, .edu, and .org websites that are credible. .com, not all .coms are credible. That's why if something is suspicious, you're not sure if it's credible, then you have to use Kapow. And if it passes the Kapow test, then it's credible. And so O is it objective. And then W means writing style. Is the writing style professional? Is the, does the writing, it's similar to logos. So ethos, pathos, logos, it is very overlapping in Kapow, okay? How you can tell if your argument is, is valid or have fallacies is very similar to how you can tell something uh, credible evidence. Because here you have ethos, which is C and A, and then pathos, uh, is more or less O, and then logos is more or less W, okay? So C-A-P-O-W do correspond to your ethos, pathos, and logos. Do you understand what I mean? Mm -hmm. yeah. Did you study ethos, pathos, and logos in the military? No, not really. I had, I had a military student tell me that they did study, he did study that in some co critical thinking course that he took in the military. And then several, several military students raised their hands and said, yes, they did. And then others went, no, they didn't. It, it was about half, it was like a 50%, uh, you know, across, because I used to teach at a military university. So I would mm -hmm. ask, did you study this? Half and half. So that's why I asked. It's a half and half kind of a thing. Yeah. I guess it must be one of those um, um, things that you take when you want to kind of a course in, in the military. Like if you're interested in critical thinking. Here are some more examples of in-text citations. Music therapy improves short-term memory. So that's a medical fact. The level of poverty will decrease if one can have benefits such as health insurance, IRAs, and other uh, irregular jobs. And so here you have a, a statistical fact. Okay, so here you have the level of poverty is a statistical fact, so you need a um, in-text citation. Uh, in Missouri, new officers start $13.50 an hour. That you need, you need a in-text citation. So here are all um, more examples of dates, historical facts, percentages. Um, reparations will be a step forward toward breaking the generational cur curse of belittlement. This has to do with racism. And so here is a historical fact, and you need a author, date, and page number. And 60% of adolescents spend their last hour before their sleep on phones. And they sleep one hour less than those who don't. This is a reason that sleep deprivation is very common these days. And so author, date, and page number. Because this is a in-text, a direct quote in-text citation. And so um, this should be very clear. What is APA? And I, with you, I've already done APA since week three. So this is this, the reason why I do that is that by the time I do week ten, this is all. This should all be old hat, except for Kapow. Everything else should be old hat, isn't it? 
Yeah, pretty much. Yes, you uh, yes. kind of rub that in quite a bit. <laughs> so, yes, that's, 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 it's, it's, it's called Make It Stick. It's a great book. I, I got mm -hmm. the idea. Normally, I would teach APA only this week. I would have started and ended right now. <laughs> this would be the first time and only time I would actually talk about it, and then people won't remember a darn thing because it's too mm -hmm. new, too new and too much at the same time. So the book uh, Make It Stick said, no, you got to stick it in earlier and then repeat yourself like crazy. And I remember reading the book. We were discussing it at the book club, and I said, won't that like make it boring for the students? And the other teachers said, no, it won't, because they barely remember the first few times you said it. Each time you say it, they remember a little bit more. So it's not boring. It's boring to you, because you have to say it over and over again. But it's not boring to them. Oh, OK. Uh, so each time you remember more and more, so I'm thinking. And so here you have. Um, a reference citation. This is from your uh, le inter interactive lectures. Have you read your interactive lectures? Um, no, not all. Not, not all. Yeah, most people don't look at those interactive lectures. It's, it's just a summary of your readings. And can you imagine people not even reading their summaries? Anyway, so here is a sample of your Week 10 Credible Sources worksheet. So on your worksheet, you're going to write here, you write the website. This is the only place you can write the website link, and it's OK, because they ask for it. Then they ask for the title of the page. You write the title of the page, title of the website. And then in one and three sentences, explain why the source is credible. Then you're going to go through the whole, uh, you're going to go through the whole, um, the whole thing. I changed this in the other one. OK, and so here you have. Uh, because C, it's, it's C-A-P-O-W, and then here you have why it's uh, credible. And here, this is where people get confused. When it says, quote, with APA in-text citation, here they're asking for a direct quote, okay? So this is not clearly stated, but when you do your, uh, when you do your uh, worksheet, they're asking for a direct quote. So you're going direct, to directly quote from anywhere 70%, well, not this particular one, but mm -hmm. some kind of quote, 70% of people with COVID will die. Well, this was before, I should write in before the vaccine, before, this is, this is old, the mm -hmm. vaccine, 70% of people, of people, uh, died uh, with COVID died. Okay, that, that's something like that. Now, now I have to um, update this. And then so anyway, so here you take the uh, quote, you write directly, and then you have the author, the date, the page number. And then here you have before the vaccine, or the vaccine, uh, most people uh, died of COVID, at least most old people died of COVID, uh, that sort of thing. All right, then here you, you summarize. So the first one, quote, is a direct quote, and the second one is a paraphrase. Paraphrase yes. with APA. And the difference is that when you do the paraphrase, you don't need quotation marks with a paraphrase, and you don't need a page number. That's the difference between a direct quote and a paraphrase quote. So what's the difference between a direct quote and a paraphrase quote? So we don't put the page number, basically. What and, and and the paraphrase is in your own words, so we don't have to put the quotation marks either. Very good. Yes. Yeah. So that's that's the only difference. And that this is where people get confused. Then they confuse reference. These are the three things people confuse: direct mm -hmm. quote, paraphrase quote, and reference citation. So when I say reference, I mean reference citation. And so when you have the reference citation, which is the very last thing that you do, then you write in Smith Patrick the severity of COVID, American Medical Journal retrieved, when you retrieved it, from uh, whatever the website is. And you're going to do this three times. You're going to find me three credible sources. So that's sure. source one. Here you have another source two. This is cancer in society. Mm -hmm. And then you have, why is this credible? C-A-P-O-W. It's credible because it's current. C, A, because the author is an expert and not an actor. P, the purpose is not to sell you something, so it is educational. O, it is objective and shows both sides of the issue. And then, and then you would give an example from the article. I didn't do that. Writing style is formal, and you give an example from the uh, article. And then here, because this is about cancer, 70% of people die of cancer. And so here you have, so you could tell that I, in this case, I made this up. 
but you are going to take it from an article, and then you're going to put the article here, and then you just have to have the correct. Now, these three sources can either be three sources that for your hobby, three sources for um, something you're interested in, or three sources for a paper you have to write in another class, or three sources for your comparison contrast paper. So it doesn't matter what three sources. So you could actually just list the three sources or the three sources that you had for your a persuasive essay. Just write it correctly, you know? So it's up to you what three sources you want to put. That's not important. What's important is that you use APA correctly, that I want to see a correct direct quote, paraphrase mm -hmm. quote, and reference citation. I was just correcting somebody's paper and she just she didn't have a her paraphrase quote. Okay, she left that out. But she did everything else correctly. So she even did her kapow correctly. So, uh, and, and also, I, in the announcements, I have a video in the announcements where I go over this much slower. And the only thing I go over in the video is just the worksheet. So you don't have to listen to a whole thing about um, all the mistakes people made in their week 9 forum. You don't have to listen to week 11 stuff. You don't have to listen about fake news or fallacies, which is what this, this uh, you know, uh, lecture is going to be about. But mm -hmm. that video is only going to be about this worksheet. So if you have a short attention span and not too much time, then that's, that, that video is for you. But that's in the, in the announcements. I don't think a lot of people look in their announcements for the videos. But that's oh, what I, I put it. I do have the announcement part opened up because I was looking at what you wanted on the um, on the worksheet. So that's why I'm, I have another computer here. So I was just kind of following it with that. So, you know. Oh, you have you have, you have two screens. I was thinking of getting two yeah. screen. I think I'll get a two screener is when I get classes with more than one student because teachers who have like 15 students, some of the students don't even appear in this Zoom thing, and you have to yeah. have a second screen to look at students. So yeah, I'll get a second screen when I get more students. So here you have another example of source three. Website link, title of the page, title of the website. In three sentences, write why your source is credible using Kapow. Then you write your um, direct quote here. Okay, so number six, direct quote. It doesn't say so in the, in the worksheet, so it's confusing for people. And then you have your the paraphrase quote, and then your reference citation. And that's it. That's the whole. That's the whole assignment for the week ten worksheet. That's all you have to do for this Sunday. Okay, it's just mm -hmm. these three sources, and then you have uh, to just, do it directly. And that's yeah, it. One, one question on the sources: um, Do we want to make sure that it's coming from a .edu, .org, or .gov, or could it be like if it's a book, you get it from? I mean, you obviously put all the necessary publications. It can be from a book. Yes, as long it as it can be. Yes, it can be from a book, of course. You can, you can get it from a journal. That's also a physical journal it's because okay. I use a lot of books. Let's see. Mm -hmm. Because most for this, of our... For this, uh, for this particular lecture, I used, I think, fact or fiction. I don't know if you can see it. It's kind of blurry, but yeah. I, anyway. I see you holding it up. Because most of our or my other classes, they don't want to see any in-text citation or any think if it's not edu or dot org or dot gov okay okay yeah. that's why if it's dot com that's why you got to use kapow <laughs> you see because the reason why we have kapow is you have a lot of suspicious looking websites mm -hmm. and therefore you got to do the kapow in order to tell whether it's credible now the reason why they tell you that it's got to be dot edu dot gov and and dot org is that a lot of people a lot of people have not yet learned kapow uh, yet and so the mm -hmm. easiest way for people to avoid uh, fallacious uh, sources is mm -hmm. just simply to tell students to avoid .com altogether and mm -hmm. just go to .edu, .org, and .gov. Because those are, those are that and peer-reviewed and Google Scholar, okay? Peer-reviewed mm -hmm. articles in your library, Google Scholar, and then edu, .gov, and .org. Those are the five most credible sources you can find that I was going about to go over different kinds of credible sources after I go over how to do the week 11 forum. So in the week 11 forum, all you have to do is post the rough draft of your comparison contrast essay. Remember, I said 7, 8, 11, 12. So 7, 8, 
is the um, first two stages of pre-writing and writing, and then uh, rewriting is going to be 11 and 12. 7, 8, 11, 12 is the writing process of your comparison contrast essay, and 9 and 10, something else. And so here, when we go to the week 11, um, post the same thing, but the rough draft of your uh, week uh, of your comparison contrast essay. Then you're going to do peer review uh, to people's essay and tell them how they can, and, and this counts a lot. This counts a lot more than your week nine, okay, because when you um, peer review someone's essay, that's going to be for their final draft, which is going to count for your week 12 final exam. So week 11 and week 12 is more important than week 9, okay, your forum-wise. So you need to participate more in week 11, and you need to, because I only saw 85 posts as opposed to 100 posts earlier in the forum. So people need to, uh, to help other people with their final grades, because that's, we're almost done. Aren't you excited about being done? Yeah. <laughs> so here, here you have, here you have uh, somebody's rough draft. And then uh, this person has absolutely no in-text citations. In your comparison contrast, you need to have at least one in-text citation somewhere. Okay, so some, this person needs to uh, put in, I don't know, somewhere. I'm, I didn't read the whole thing, so uh, you got to make sure that, you know, you have an in-text citation somewhere, and then you put in Smith, see how it matches? So this person didn't even have an in-text citation at all, and then she would have gotten some points off. Then when you write your sample uh, up to Sunday, so you have to, you got to post, this is due on Wednesday of week 11, and then when you post it to students, that's due on Sunday. And so here you have, Jan, you have a really great essay. You have a thesis with three reasons. You write about how books are better than movies because books improve language skills for children. You have great essay structure, Jan, but you need to fix your grammar errors. For instance, you're, you have sentence fragments. Actually, this person does have sentence fragments because I just saw one of her sentences begin with which. Which brings me to another reason you should read the book. And as soon as you see someone begin a sentence, what, what, what is a which? How come we cannot start a sentence with which? What is the grammar rule for that? What happens if you start something with which? Because, uh, it, it, like you said, it will be a sentence fragment. So the end of the sentence has to be followed with a comma, and then you give the actual portion of it. Yes. And so here, what happens is we get rid of this this uh, comma, this whatchamacallit, and so this was a fused sentence because it had a period over here and it mm -hmm. ran into this sentence. Remember the fused sentences? Right. I respect my parents, something about careers, and then fused, they were fused together. Uh, Chinese, some kind of language, I forgot, now I forgot. In the reading, the book version is better than watching the movies. What's wrong with that sentence? What? Grammar rule. If after the in the end there should be a comma. Yes, in the okay. end, in the end. So when you have a um, transition word in the end, in conclusion, finally, reading the the book version is better than watching the movies. What's wrong with this sentence? In books, you have to do something that little children do every day, and that is using your imagination. I would say two mistakes in that one. Mm. I would remove the in and just go with books, have you do something that little children do every day, put a comma there and then say and, or another comma there too, in fact, and put the last portion is that is using your imagination. So there'll be- Yes, okay. And then if you want to emphasize an idea and that is, and then you can put in using your imagination. So if you yeah. want to emphasize Oh, it shouldn't be that is. Okay. Anyway, so if you want to emphasize something, you use a dash. So uh, movies are good, but reading is better for you. Notice how after we've already done, we've already assumed this person has good essay structure because we've already gone over or read over this essay. So that's known as revision. So once you assume the person has excellent essay, uh, essay uh, structure, then we go over, oh, where's the comma? Oh, look, too many simple sentences. He needs to put together more coordination or subordination. So sentence variety, we go over grammar. So that's known as proofreading. So we look over grammar after we look over essay structure. Now, 
that are you clear about what to do for the week 10 um, and what to do for the week 10 worksheet in the week 11 forum that's crystal clear yeah that is that's pretty clear because i mean you made it very clear on the announcement as to exactly what was needed so i still had a student asking me what are we doing on the week 11 rough draft even after all this you know but i, I then i told her also i also put in a picture a very funny picture of i forgot what oh, i wrote the, with the with the batman. dinosaur i forgot no that's, that's another one for the week 11 i put in batman is better than superman and then I, then I said, we're coming back to the week, week 11 comparison and contrast. We took a break. Now we're coming back to it. And we're going to post our rough draft. That's what I, that's what I wrote. That's the picture for week 11. Anyway, so getting back to reliable sources. So what, are, what in reliable sources? You have peer-reviewed sources, primary sources, general sources. And so here you have primary sources. So a primary source is when you get it direct, when you get the information directly from the person. Primary source would be if you were to ask me directly, what was it like to have an aunt who had to escape from the Japanese with nothing but their clothes on their backs and run away with just the clothes on your back while the Japanese bombs your house, your whole village gets obliterated. And as I tell the story, then I'm the primary source because it's my aunt that had to watch her husband and children, true story, killed. The only reason why she lived was because at 6 a.m. in the morning, she always went to the market to get food while her husband and children slept. As she exited her house, she saw the bomb obliterate, come down, and just obliterate her husband and children. So instead of going to the market, she ran to her sister's house and said, you need to get out of here now because the, 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 the jets are coming. And it's, then they all got out of the house. And it's just like a movie. They got out of the house and everything got bombed. So if she had not, uh, my sister, grandmother's sister, had not warned my grandmother to get everybody out of the house, my father would not have survived, and now I wouldn't be here talking to you. So that's known as a primary source, is the original, that's a true story, that's original, um, she lived to be 100, she never remarried, mm -hmm. and um, she always, she looked so sad because she missed her husband and three children. It was just instantaneously, they were gone. One second they would, and she would have been gone too, had she not gone to the market. Anyway, so primary source is when you have the person, the direct witness, like Abraham Lincoln. You ask Abraham Lincoln himself, what was the Civil War like? So that would be like conference presentations, memoirs, photographs and paintings, speeches, works of literature. So someday if I write a book about my aunt, which I will, um, that will be work, a primary source, uh, government, uh, documents because I'll be working from her diary. So also diaries are also a primary source. Secondary source is if someone were to write a story about me. If you were to write a story about my aunt, you were to write a story about my family, that would be a secondary source. So secondary sources are not original sources. Instead, these sources seek to analyze, interpret, or comment on primary sources. So secondary sources include biographies, literature reviews, articles written about primary sources. And then you have general reference materials, which are also um, credible. You've got encyclopedias, not Wikipedia, uh, world fact books, dictionaries, atlases, and manuals. And obviously, the, to answer your question, books, periodicals, reports, videos, and journals. And so these, can, these are also considered reliable sources. And so um, the, the most uh, reliable source, obviously, is a peer-reviewed source. And a peer-reviewed source is found in your Fortis library. That's all those databases. Have you gone to the Fortis library? Yeah. Yes, I have. Mm -hmm. How do you like it? Uh, a lot of information there. Sometimes it's, uh, if you're trying to find like a, a singular thing about something, um, it, there's so much to go through to find information on just one item, you know. So you have to be really focused on exactly what you're looking for. Yes, yeah, so that's 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 that's, uh, that's uh, that that's um, knowing how to use the search engine. That's why uh -huh. when you make a thesis statement, your thesis statement needs to be narrow and focused. So that way, when you put in the search engine, then it becomes narrow and focused. You cannot just write abortion because that's yeah. way too much. You want to write the disadvantages of abortion if you're going to have a late-term pregnancy in the state of New Jersey 
or something like that. Yeah, you, exactly. You need qualifiers to narrow your search, or you're going to get a billion, a billion, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. So uh, when you have a peer-reviewed source, okay, so anything ending in edu and org, this I took from your uh, interactive lecture, which is also in your uh, orientation, because Fortis gives an orientation teaching media literacy, which obviously a lot of students either aren't aware of or don't bother to take. So that's why they ask me these, that's why I get all these mistakes. So here, the difference between a popular source, like um, the National Enquirer, or peer-reviewed source. So in a popular source, anybody can upload anything. You rarely have credentials. In a peer-reviewed source, you, uh, people are experts in their field. It's about doctors, and it's usually some kind of scientific paper. And in a popular source, it's written for everybody. You really have to water down your source in order for every the average Joe to understand. And then here, in a scholarly source, it's written for experts. That's why scholarly sources are very hard to read, and that's why they use a lot of jargon, because they assume you already learned what that means. And then here, uh, articles may or may not have short summaries. Uh, in a newspaper, the headline is the summary. The first sentence is the summary. The five W's, who, what, where, when, how. You remember that? All of that has to be in the headline. So that would be the summary in your regular newspaper. And then in a scholarly source, your summary is your abstract. And the abstract is about two paragraphs long, and I will be going over that in the week 11 forum when I go over the parts of a science paper. And then when I go over the parts of a science paper, then I'll also be teaching you how to read a scholarly source because it's, both, it's about the same thing, okay? Uh, that's, that's the scholars, that's, they all have to follow the same format. Did you notice that it's always the same format when you read the scholarly sources? Oh yeah, absolutely, because um, after you told me about Google Scholar, like I said, because I have a lot of psychology papers I have to write, and uh, Google Scholar, after you told me about it, is the only place where I go to because there's so much you know, information and every piece of paper written by some psychologist always has the abstract, and once you read it, you get a real clear understanding of whether yeah. it's going to be the right uh, source for you or not. So Yeah, because I, so what I'm going to go over in next week's lectures, I'm going to go over what we, what, when, how to write, a, how you would write a science paper. Once you understand how you would write a science paper, it becomes so easy to understand other people's science papers. You also will learn which science papers are valid and which are fallacious. Which, which are that sort of thing. So there's a kapow for that as well. Kapow is everywhere, you see. Uh, and then here you have more. Um, here you have, in, like for instance, in Wikipedia, popular sources, they don't cite their sources. They don't have in-text citations. Whereas in a peer-reviewed source, you have, you have uh, that people cite their sources and you have references. And here you have, instead, you have a lot of photographs and illustrations. And here, in a scholarly source, you have tables and graphs, and, and you have numbers. So that's how come when you write a paper, you would want a lot of numbers. But if you use numbers, you have to cite the source. And then here, um, you have no editor. And in Wikipedia, you can just put whatever you want up there. Uh, and then here, in um, a scholarly source, you have specific guidelines. So in order to get published in a journal, you have to follow the guidelines of that journal. So if you want to get published in a journal, you've got to read the other articles the journal has and then write an article in that same format, in that same theme, but on something slightly different that, you, that others haven't read before. And, it's, and then before it gets published, a whole bunch of scientists will read your paper to see if it's good enough for that journal. That's known as the peer review. So if they think, wow, your article is good enough for our journal, then that means someone, a whole bunch of people have read it and they approve of it and then it's undergone rigorous peer review and then that's known as, that's why the peer review article has already been approved by experts. Unreliable sources are Wikipedia, blogs, tweets, personal papers, some sites ending in .com, most sites ending in .com, right. forums, and biased sites like why is it okay to, why we should hate Nazis or, or something like that. So unreliable sources can be highly interesting and may lead to but, and insightful. Sometimes they lead to valid information, but they're not. 
So what are some, it, why is Wikipedia an unreliable source? Um, I think it's because anybody can go and add anything on there. Yeah, I remember in the early 2020s, someone added 9-11 was a hoax. And when you're talking to a bunch of military students, that's very highly offensive because a lot of them have laid their lives down, you know, for to fight for the country and to say that, you know, everything they fought for is a hoax. Is so that's why I said that's very effective with, with you know with military students is that that's why we don't use Wikipedia. Another time they said Bob Hope he was still alive. Uh, he was 90 at the time. They said Bob Hope has passed away. And Bob Hope was watching television at the time, and he watched himself on TV passing away. He's like, what? I'm passed away? But I'm still here. I'm watching TV. So someone uploaded that to, to Wikipedia. So that's how you can... Uh, and also there was a president. I, I don't remember which one, but they said one of the presidents, who was still alive at the time, was dead or something. That was also a hoax. I don't remember which president it was. That president... So anyway, they had to take it. Once Wikipedia found out about it, they took it down. So that sort of thing. Um, so how do you find credible sources? And I just went over currency, authority, purpose, objective, and writing style. So that's what Kapow stands for. How new is the website? Authority. Who wrote it? Purpose. What do they want me to know? In other words, is it biased? I mean, is it an ad? Objective. Is it fact or opinion? In other words, is it fact? A fact would be objective. And an opinion without credible sources would be biased. And then writing style. Does it list sources? Does it have good grammar? Is it professional? Does it have a thesis statement? And does, and does it make sense? Does it have logos? So writing style has to do with logos. So that is Kapow. Out of all of these articles, which one of these articles represents an unreliable source? can't really see them. Uh... I know, I can't make it any bigger. I don't think. I made Let me it. see. Okay. Is that better? So the first three are dot coms. Oh, they're actually all dot coms. They're all dot coms. Let's just say let's just say one of these articles is less reliable than the other others. Because some dot coms can be Eh, digestible, but there's one that is definitely never, um, never um, reliable and notorious, always notorious for being um, unreliable. Which one is that? There's only one of them like that. I am not sure. Anything that says sponsored by. As soon as you see a sponsored oh. by, then you okay. know that, then you know it's an ad. And when it's an ad, then we, it, it doesn't fulfill purpose. Okay. You always have to say, is it an ad? So as soon as you see sponsored stories, we know that's not reliable. And so that's why we use Kapow to make sure that all the suspicious stuff, this is the typical suspicious junk we see on the net. So this is not a .edu, this is not .gov, this is not .org. When you have those, or Google Scholar, when you have those kind of sources, you don't need to use Kapow, okay? When you use Google Scholar, you don't need Kapow. So it's when you have stuff like this, that's when we use Kapow. And well, so there's, obviously, two, there's two of them that say sponsored. Oh, I didn't see that one. Okay, I only saw that one. Well, all I know is every time you see sponsored, sponsored by buying right, then you know that they're trying to look like an, a, a legitimate article, okay? So then it, okay. and they're just, but actually it's an ad. Okay, so that's, that's one way in which we, we find an unreliable source. And so here I can make it bigger, yeah. So, and so how is Kapow similar to Ethos, Pathos, and Logos? So on the currency, we are focusing on the Ethos side of things, uh, objective, the Pathos, and the writing style for Logos to see how it's going to be, uh, uh, if the grammar is correct, they've listed the sources, and if it makes sense as well. Excellent. Yes, you got it. So Kapow incorporates the same thing. Same thing with crap, okay? I'm going to show that. It's, it's just another way of remembering it, but uh, okay. that's, that's at the end. And so would you say that these sources are scholarly? Are these, are these popular sources, uh, no, scholarly they, or non-scholarly sources? These would all be popular. 
popular. These are all popular, popular sources. So whatever you see at the supermarket, that is a popular source. Do we believe the popular sources for our paper? No, because most of them are advertisements. Most of them are advertisements. So we can always recognize uh, non-credible sources by their emotion and tone. It's always, look what happened to such and such an actress. If a news story has a dramatic deadline or includes exclamation points, it may be false or misleading. So be skeptical, be skeptical, of, skeptical of stories that make use of emotionally charged language. Balanced news sources use neutral language and standard punctuation in headlines and stories. Consider the source. If the source is unknown or not well known, be suspicious. Beware of articles that do, do not list an author or publication date. Trusted news sources will include information about article, author, and the publication date. Citation and images. If an article does not include information about the source of facts, quotes, and images, that's Wikipedia, it could be a false story. It is extremely easy to cut and paste quotes from other stories or use mislabeled photographs found online. Try a Google reverse image search to find photographic search sor sources. Social media, we, be we don't believe anything we see on, so that that's just like the water fountain. If you first saw a story on social, me social media site like Facebook or Twitter, there is a chance that the news may be false, misleading, or biased. Make sure to check out the accuracy of any story you see on social media before you share it. Check trusted sources of news or for similar stories. Uh, that's, a, that's, that's also not, that's something you do do, but what happened was one time someone posted a false story on social media. Then all the other news stations picked up on that story without checking the, the veracity of the story, and then it just went on fire because everybody else was, was doing it. It turned out that story was too false because somebody was so fast in getting to the story they didn't check the facts. So sometimes you have to wait a while. So you want to add in, besides check trusted sources, you wait a while. And then you check for similar stories. Because usually, even if you wait a while, people realize, oops, yeah, yeah, you want to wait for the oops factor. So non-credible sources is a term that has come to mean fake stories or fake stories. Stories with no verifiable facts, sources, or quotes. So these stories may be propaganda that is intentionally designed to mislead the reader or may be designed as clickbait, written for economic uh, incentives. In other words, the writer profits on the number of people who click on the story. In recent years, fake news stories have proliferated via social media because they are so easily shared online. Non-credible source is another word for fallacy. That is, when you make a claim without using credible sources, or if you're missing one of the appeals, in which it's only pathos, or, or it's lacking logos or lacking ethos. That's also a non-credible source. So do you believe everything that you see and read in social media? Me per personally? No. Yeah. <laughs> I see a lot of goofy articles on Facebook, so. Do you, do, you teach, do you teach your children not to trust everything that they read on Facebook and Twitter? Oh yeah, absolutely, because I have my kids come and tell me, did you read? Because I eat a lot of, I like bananas. And they're like, oh, did you know bananas can do this? I'm like, where did you see that? And they're like, well, there's an article on Facebook on it. Like, oh, please don't read that part. So, so yeah, it, we've had this discussion before. Yeah, and what, and, and you, you would teach, that's why I believe, because I used to teach, you, you see this whole lesson is about media literacy, about how to spot fake news or how to spot non-credible sources. So I teach, I also teach this to people as young as fifth grade, okay? So fifth grade, this can be converted into a fifth grade lesson and or for teenagers. Um, it's not just for adults, so that everyone can't be such a, 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 a not a banana, a doormat and, and just believe everything that they see and read. Otherwise, you're a doormat, okay? And so, and another thing is, have you ever gossiped about someone and you believe the gossip? Yes. Yeah, I remember we we're all guilty of that. But then, have you ever been have you ever been a victim of that gossip and known that that gossip was untrue? Yes, also, <laughs> I've been on the other side of that too, absolutely. 
And how did it feel when they, when they put, did, did you not care? Some people don't care. Some people actually live for that. But most uh, people don't. I think both sides on that too. I, I remember we used to gossip in the faculty chat room about, oh, did you know Mr. Smith is dating Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Jones? It's usually the math teachers or the science teachers dating the English teachers. You know, and then of course that that that, that, was, that would be cute. But then then but but then they're married. Mr. Smith is married. Mrs. Smith is married. So everybody's whispering about how those two are, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, um, one of the gossip was true. The other one wasn't. So you know, um, they they're, they're saying that you should avoid gossiping and av avoid propaganda, clickbait, sponsored content, partisan conspiracy theories, and pseudoscience. All of these are different kinds of uh, non-credible sources or fake news. So propaganda adopted by governments, corporations, and nonprofits to manage attitudes, values, and knowledge. It appeals to emotion only. It lacks logos and it lacks ethos. And it can be beneficial or harmful. Clickbait, eye-catching sensational headlines designed to distract. It drives ad uh, interview, revenue sponsored content, advertising made to look like an editorial, potential conflict of interest, interest for genuine news organizations, and partisan. In other words, you're, you're saying, um, we're just for Democrats. We don't like Republicans. All those Republicans suck. Or the other way around, all those Democrats suck. That's known as partisan. So that's ideological, and it, it would include an interpretation of facts that's not impartial. In other words, they would say, uh, Biden is old and doddering and shouldn't be president. Or they would say, uh, Trump cannot be trusted because he's insane. So those are all considered non-credible sources and partisan. So you want to avoid that. Conspiracy theory tries to explain simply complex realities as a response for fear or uncertainty. Not, not falsible. In other words, you come up with plausible theories with no credible evidence to explain away something you don't understand. So Area 51, um, I think aliens are the most um, common one and most popular for uh, science fiction, right? That the, that the cell phone, that they're housing aliens inside of a government installation in Area 51. Where is the proof? Where are the experts? So that's a conspiracy. That's one of the milder conspiracy theories. I wouldn't want to say the other ones online because they're so, um, what would you say, <laughs> controversial and, and, and strange. I mean, I've read the stranger ones. Um, and when I, was, when I was researching for this, you know, doing the, this lecture, and I was researching, so what example conspiracy theories can I use for this class? And so as I was reading it, I'm like, oh, no, I'm not using that one. No, I'm not using that one. I'm going to use the mild ones like the Earth is flat or the moon landing was faked and was shot uh, somewhere in a Hollywood studio. And those are the tame ones, you see. Uh, oh, another one that I like. Elvis is still alive. And Elvis likes to attend his own Elvis conventions. And he pretends to be himself and loses to somebody else. That one I like. Okay, so uh, that's why Elvis loves it. So that's, that's, that's a conspiracy theory uh, that I like. Pseudoscience, in other words, miracle cures, anti-vaccination and climate change denial. That sounds a tad bit partisan. But anyway, it misrepresents real scientific studies with exaggerated or false claims. Often contradicts experts, snake oil. Back in the 19th century, they had salesmen that would sell bottles of, they would say, okay, this is going to cure the common cold. You're going to buy this bottle and you're going to be totally well from whatever your sickness is. And these, they were known as snake oil salesmen. They would go from house to house. And so that would be known as pseudoscience. That comes from the 19th, 18th century, way before technology. These are the last few ones. Satire and hoax. If you ever gone to the onion? to uh, look at their satire. They, they openly tell you that they make fun of the headlines. So that satire, hoax, error, misinformation, that includes a mix of uh, false and factual content. And then you have just fake content. And people do it for money, politics. Sometimes they do it for humor, passion, or they do it to misinform. Uh, and so here you can get more information from the uh, EAVI. That's where I got that's where I got this. And this would be good for your kids. 
So you could, you could have your kids look this over and then you could say, okay kids, these are examples of things you're not going to believe. And then you, your, the parent, are going to explain in kitty, kitty language what is propaganda, clickbait. Clickbait's the easiest. If you see uh, where, what happened to this actress or something like that, something that looks juicy, that's, that's, the, that's the one that, and also something that says sponsored stories, sponsored content. Uh, those are all ads. Not to, so this you can show to kids because kids like graphs, you know? So, uh, and then once, once kids, here is an example of clickbait. If you're a uh, male and you like looking at, wow, she's beautiful, aren't you going to automatically click to see, wow, what does she know, okay? As soon as you click on her pretty face, somebody earns a lot of money. And so whatever information is in, you know, she is very pretty. And whatever information is there, it's not real, okay? So here are three tricks to look young. And women want to click on it because they want to look young. And guys want to look, on, look at it because they want to see more of her, okay? So you get clickbait for, from both sexes. This is very, whoever made this, very smart. Sponsor, so here you have sponsored articles. So are sponsored articles a reliable source? No. And wh why are they fallacies of relevance? Uh, because sponsored articles are mostly for distraction. Yeah, for distraction. They're fact. They're, they're fiction. Here's another one. Navigating the holidays. Uh, tips for ha handling uh, dietary restrictions. The California Beef Council. This might be a tad partisan because they want you to continue to buy beef. So even if someone says beef might not be good for you, but instead what they're going to do is they're going to tell you all the ways that beef is really really uh, delicious. Okay, I, I think that the, so this is a this is an, an ad. Here's one that's not easy for people to tell, especially if you don't know what to look for. Propaganda. Propaganda is a type of news used to mislead or trick people to promote a biased point of view or promote a political cause. Many politicians make full use of propaganda because they know people do not have the time to double check their sources. So you can use the Kapow method to see if something is propaganda. Mostly it's an O as an objective. Is propaganda objective? No, because they're acting on your emotions and they're acting on only, mainly pathos. So they're not very, and they're also cherry picking. Only their facts uh, they put in. They don't put in the other side. So here they fail the O part of Kapow. They also fail the A part because it's not written by experts. So propaganda is a fallacy of relevance. So here is an example. You might not, you might not think that this is propaganda, but China is very, 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 very famous for its propaganda. And so here is an example of an English, uh, it's a Chinese newspaper translated into English. And so in any newspaper, you, usually, you can see a combination of good news, crime, bad news, uh, sorry, good news, bad news. And here, all you get are good news, good news, good news, and good news. You would think that you live in paradise or that the people there never commit crimes, never make mistakes, never have problems, that may, or never have flaws because they're perfect. And so here you have, they support multiculturalism. They, 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 they are very tolerant with their religious whatever. Everybody is happy, okay? Here you have, uh, here we, we have a state of democracy and everybody is always happy. We are clearing out Omicron and we are all healthy. And so this is all propaganda in order to make China look good, okay? Anything from China, I could, this is very easy for me to get, okay? Because I get a, in the LA Times, there's a pullout and everything about that is about China. And so here, this is all propaganda to make China look good. And then here you have all the different discoveries. Look at this. The Chinese Olympians are winning gold medals. And here, um, the myth of U.S. dollar democracy. So therefore, the U.S. is decadent while China is not decadent, etc., etc., etc. And so here you have uh, some, some new trends. So everything that makes China look good. Now, I'm sure China is not the only country that does this, are they? I think China is the only one that's this obvious in doing this. I think that every country does it, but it's more subtle 
because if you're this obvious, say in Europe, they, they, they would slam you silly, okay? They would say this is all fake immediately. But in China, you can get away with this. And in Europe, you have to uh, make it a little more nuanced. But then it takes a little more work to tell, oh, okay, that's also propaganda. But this is easier for, for students to see that Chinese propaganda is an example of media bias, where China only presents one side of anything, of everything. They don't discuss anything negative that would make China look bad. No crime reports, no homicides, no bad news. It's like everybody is, everybody is perfect. Uh, nobody is perfect. Uh, it's more like everybody is perfect. Learn to recognize, and this is also known as cherry picking fallacy. That means we don't, we only cherry pick what we want to see, and we don't want the world to see the fact that, that anything, you know, because like any country, everybody has problems. So whatever problems people have in China, uh, they don't show it. Everybody has problems. There's no such no such thing as a place on earth with no problems. That doesn't matter what your politics. And another one is satire and parody. Okay, and so here uh, is an example of satire. Okay, L.A. mayor prevents his kid from uh, lazying or being lazy by installing spikes on the family couch. Is this a real article? Would you really put spikes on your family couch for your for your kids to sit on? So yeah, this he's being. This is from the Onion. They're being sarcastic and they're making fun of. Um, I forget what it is they're making fun of. This is what, this was funny to me. Usually, though, I'm not very good at seeing satire, so uh, I don't really go for the Onion. Have you gone? To, have you seen the Onion before, just for fun? No. So here you have the Onion, and um, do you believe in satire as entertainment? Mm. Can you tell when something's being like satirical and get the joke? Yes, sometimes. Mm -hmm. I I'm, I usually don't really look at it, most of those things, so that's why it's not uh, common for me to you know look at those kind of articles. And then here you have sponsored stories. Here I was showing you the other. These are examples of when it says sponsored stories. Yeah. And then here you have all of these sponsored, sponsored, sponsored. They look real, but they're not. Okay. Mm -hmm. Here you have sponsored, sponsored, this whole thing, sponsored stories you may like. You may like yeah. And then, this, then you would tell your kids this whole thing is not something you would believe in. Kids won't know that, okay, for sure. Okay, because when I ask my niece, do you think these are real or not real? I was teaching this lesson, except you just say real or not real. You don't have to say credible and not credible because that's too long for kids. Real mm -hmm. or not real is good enough. Is this a lie or is it truth? That's another one, okay? When kids see that people are lying, oh my God, they go for that. Uh, then they want to find the lies everywhere. When, once you teach them this, then they find it everywhere. Wow, they're lying, they're lying, teacher. Look at this, they're lying. I don't know why kids find that so fascinating, mm -hmm. uh, but they do. So then a conspiracy theory. What is a conspiracy theory? Uh, basically, I would say putting out infactual or you know non-factual information that would really get an interest of everybody and make them think like uh, you know something they've talked about could actually be true yeah like JFK was not just killed by one assassin but by the CIA someone mm -hmm. said that there's a thousand conspiracy theory books about the death of JFK, also about the death of Abraham Lincoln as well. Also, there were more than one person that killed Abraham Lincoln. Well, that's further back, so people don't. And then there's the moon landing, the earth is flat, um, and the stuff about President Obama, uh, Area 51. There's also the one about Tupac Shakur not being dead, uh, mm -hmm. alien technology, and um, COVID will be over by Easter. So all of that, uh, are what was listed under conspiracy, conspiracy. theory, uh -huh. that bias, okay, challenging. So when we go to the, the social media, we have confirmation bias. So Facebook has an algorithm where they put in everybody, everything that you believe, and they only put things that you believe onto your news feed. And this has caused everybody to be like polarized. So people, all the people who believe in Democrats all hang out on one news feed. All the people who believe in Republicans will all hang out on their news feed. And then nobody talks across the aisle anymore. So this is so that's why they say social media 
I think social media is a big cause of polarization in which you don't talk to people to you don't you don't you don't talk to people who don't agree with you. People have forgotten how to agree to disagree, okay? And this leads to lots of arguments and people defriending each other. And so and it also leads to confirmation bias. So when you have bias, anything that's biased is not a credible source. And that's how we uh, that's how humans uh, process information. We process information in an illogical, biased manner. And people are un un unaware that they do that because our brain is trying to make sense of the environment. And so here in the media bias, okay, and so how do we avoid bias? We engage the other side by using the Rogerian or the Toulmin argumentation method. So I went over this, so it, it, if you want to know more about it, you would talk about the other side. What is the Rogerian argumentation? You know what, I don't remember. Hang on, I have it written down. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. So. Make it stick. Oh yeah, the Rogerian is the diplomatic side, which you find a common ground and uh, do a compromise. And uh, the toolman was one side, like uh, trial lawyers and being a non-emotional part, part, yes. part of the argument. So we, we, so we engage the other side. This would be the O in kapow, being objective. So when we are objective, we talk about both sides of an issue in order to have a fair and balanced. That way it's not just your emotion. It's not partisan. So if you want to be fair, fair and objective, you not only talk about what the Democrats are doing, you also talk about what the Republicans are doing. Or you talk about all the good things Biden has done as well as the bad things that Biden has done, not just one or the other. Okay? And you'll notice that the news, news media, okay, in 2018, this is how the landscape of neutrality, of media bias, in other words, one-sidedness was. So here, AP, Bloomberg, C-SPAN, ABC News, CBS, Politico, all of this was considered neutral, okay? Things that are skewed directly in the middle. That means that they had both uh, the good and the bad and the ugly. Everything on this side has to do with being on the left, in other words, Democrats. Everybody on this side has to be uh, Repub are, are known to be Republicans. So if you listen to something like Newsmax or the Daily Signal, Fox News or uh, the Tr Daily Caller, the Tribune, um, the uh, InfoWars, Info National Review, all of these are the extreme or hyper. In other words, they're for Trump. On this side, um, Current Affairs, Truth Out, uh, TIT America, Daily Cost, these are all for Biden. And as you go this way, it becomes more progressive. And so you notice that most media either skews to the left or skews to the right. Very few media is in the middle. Why? Because if you're in the middle, it's boring. All right. It, it's usually if you have one side, you have your cheerleaders and then you just want to listen to the things that you believe in. That makes it a lot more interesting. That's why more and more media just skews to one side. They don't bother to be objective anymore. As a result, everything on this side, non-credible source. Everything on this side, non-credible source. Because they only cherry pick and talk about one side. And so as of 2018, these were only the credible sources that are neutral because they only talk about, they talk about both sides. Now let's jump to 2021. Do you see anybody at all that's neutral? Do they even bother with the word neutral? No. This means that by 2021, everything either skews to the left or skews to the right. And so most popular sources are biased today. So if you go to CNN, they, they're biased to the Democrats. If you go to the Washington Times, well, it sounds very credible, but they skew to the right. And so from 2018, where there were, were some you know, neutral media sources you could use, and now it's gotten even worse. I, I blame it on more and more social media, or TikTok, or Facebook, as more people, and people don't talk to people. who So all the people who are to the left only talk with the people to the left. 
and only people to the right are only talking to the people to the right. People are even moving, you know, for, for those. I know, I know, I mean, there are people I read about who are moving to Florida so that they could be with other people that, that think like them. And other people are moving to California to be with people who think like them. So it's, I blame it on social media, but it, this is ridiculous. So that means that most popular sources are biased and that you should be careful to be using popular sources in your paper. Better to stick with peer-reviewed sources, sources from Google Scholar, and even though those are harder to read, at least those are neutral because they talk about both sides and they stick to the facts. And what, so, source, what is the source of this thing? What is the source of this thing? www.cherylatkisson.com. Yeah. So this is the media uh, copyright 2018 at Fontis Media uh, Incorporated. So you could tell that 2018 came from 2018. At least you know that that's correct. And then 2021. And so I can look it up again to see what's 2022 to see if anything has changed because this changes so much year by year. So it will be interesting for me to see because this is as of last year. So this year I haven't really updated, so I will see this. So um, now we're going to cover, this will be the last part of my lecture, is the 10 most common fallacies you want to avoid in your writing. So here you have the ad hominem fallacy. When you attack the person, not the issue, what are some examples of ad hominem fallacies? How, that's when Clinton and Trump would uh, insult each other. And, and they would, well, I think one of them called each other despicable, and the other one called it themselves some other name. And so when you say someone is despicable, that's, that's, that's not really talking about the issues. Appeal to authority. Just because somebody says so does not make it so. So if I say Michael Jordan says we should buy these sneakers, just because Michael Jordan says these sneakers are good, that doesn't mean those sneakers are any good. Appeal to ignorance. This fallacy occurs when, when you argue that your conclusion must be true because there is no evidence against it. So example of appeal to ignorance. Oh, come on, come hang out with me. We will be great friends. The other speaker would say, why should I? And then the other speaker goes, ah, why not? So doing something for the heck of it without rhyme or reason is an appeal to ignorance. A bandwagon fallacy is just because everybody does it does not make it right. Oh, come on, let's go smoking. Everybody does it. Want to smoke? And so as so that's something you would teach. This is very important to teach teenagers, okay? This one in particular, the bandwagon fallacy. That means you don't believe in it. After fifth grade, you can teach. They will understand this, okay? So in case you're wondering, how old should they be? And I would say middle school up. Okay, begging, especially middle school, begging the question. The fallacy of begging the question occurs when an argument's premises assumes that the truth of the uh, conclusion instead of supporting it. In other words, you assume without proof. In other words, you assume that all Chinese people are, um, are smart and then you don't question it. You don't try to research it, okay? So that's begging the question. So in other words, you present a circular argument. So you would say something like, um, Professor H is a great teacher because she is a great teacher, okay? So some people, that's a circular argument. If your reason and your premise sound the same, then that's called circular argument, and that means that you didn't really say anything. When you say a reason, it has to support your premise, not repeat your premise, you see. And so some people confuse the two, that if you repeat it enough times, it must be true. That's also circular reasoning. That's how they sell you things. It's, you keep saying, this car is good, this car is good. If you say it enough times, people will start to believe it. That's also circular reasoning. A loaded question is a question that contains an unjustified assumption such as a presumption of guilt. And so an example of a loaded question is, have you finally stopped cheating on exams? So that, that presumes or that implies that the respondent has cheated on exams in the past. If the respondent answers yes, she agrees that she has cheated in the past. If she answers no, then she is still cheating. So when you have a loaded question, you limit the response of the respondent. And the respondent, no matter what he says, is caught as guilty somehow, okay? And so that's known as a trick question. 
and it's known as a complex question fallacy. And so in order to avoid trick questions or complex questions, you would ask them to repeat the question again, but reword it. Ask for clarification. Ask for definition. Clarify or define and discuss the question and build a bridge. And so um, there was a famous politician who got caught in one of these uh, trick questions. And she ended up saying something outlandish. I forgot what it was. Something about, I don't remember. And then uh, she started, so that's why you got to, when the, when the journalist tries to throw you a loaded question to make you look bad, you have to be able to catch it. So that way you don't look bad. And then another time, um, a president, okay, one of the past presidents, he, the journalist gave him a loaded question and he caught it and he scolded the, the, the journalist for saying, you're trying to make me look guilty of something I've never done. And that is a loaded question. You need to reword that question. Shame on you for doing that. He actually scolded the, the journalist in front of everybody. And then the journalist apologized. And, oh, I didn't mean it like that. I meant it like this. And when he reworded it, when the journalist re reworded it, it was no longer a loaded question. Okay, without saying who, who, and who. But basically, it's good. Uh, so here, when you have a loaded question, this is a fallacy of ambiguity because you're asking a vague question and you're assuming that the person asking the question is guilty. Oh, so you're finally off the alcohol alcoholism? So you don't drink anymore, right? And so that, that sounds like you, you're still drinking a little bit. That the answer would be, yes, I still drink, or no, I never drank, or in other words, there's some assumption of guilt into that. And so that's a trick question. And they do, and, and, and um, journalists like to do that a lot so that they can look good in front of the camera. Um, non sequitur. A non sequitur fallacy means it doesn't follow, it doesn't make sense. It occurs when you have one premise and then the reason doesn't make sense. So this we went over before when I say that you get COVID-19 because you have slanty eyes or something like that. So that's a non sequitur, okay? That means that your reason does not match your premise. So it's not just having credible sources. It's also that your logos, it's also that your reason has to make sense and match your premise, your claim. So if I, any kind of claim is like your opinion, like abortion is moral or immoral. Gun control is necessary or not necessary. So if I say that gun control is not necessary because um, not everybody uh, likes guns, or I, I can't think of it, uh, of a non sequitur, but that is a non sequitur, is Asians don't cause COVID-19. Red herring. A red herring is something that misleads or distracts from a relevant question. It's known as a logical, in other words, a red herring is used to mislead the reader from the truth. And so here you have conspiracy theories fall under this category where some people have many theories of how one gets COVID and how COVID can be cured. And red herrings are also used in mystery stories to give false clues to steer the reader away from the true killer. So let's say you have a, a, um, a so a red herring would be, um, Oh, okay. If I def it's similar to a straw man fallacy. So if if the uh, if they, they ask me, so what is your um, opinion about immigration? And then you're like, oh, you don't want to really talk about immigration because you didn't do anything about immigration during your term. So then you change the subject and you would say something irrelevant, and that would be known as a red herring. You would say, oh yes, my parents were immigrants too. What's that got to do with what is your uh, issue and what did you do about illegal immigration, for instance? What is your parents were also immigrants have to do that? So, so red herring means that you throw in a non sequitur. You throw in something somewhat similar and then you change and then you pivot quickly to a similar sounding subject. Okay, so that's very similar. So you and you throw in a lot of these false clues in order to mislead and not talk about something you don't want to talk about. Okay, it's very similar to straw man. Uh, fallacy. And then another way of using red, he red herring, this is not bad, is if you're a mystery writer and instead of saying the butler did it, end of story, you would, you would make it look suspicious. You would say, oh, or maybe, maybe the maid did it. M maybe so-and-so did it. And then you have a whole list of people who could have done it before the end of the story you finally get to the truth. Oh, it was the so-and-so who did it. Okay? So that's known as a red hair, use a red herring literary device. Okay, in other words, you throw in false clues.
to throw people off the track. So that's a red herring. A slippery slope occurs when someone makes a claim about a series of events that would lead to another event that would lead to an, usually a bad event. In this fallacy, a person makes a claim that one event leads to another event, so, in, so on, until we come to some awful conclusion. And then each faulty logic becomes more and more improbable. So here's an example of slippery slope thinking. If we enact any kind of gun control laws, the next thing you know, we won't be allowed to have guns at all. When that happens, we won't be able to uh, defend ourselves against terrorist attacks. And when that happens, terrorists will take over our country. Therefore, gun control laws will cause us to lose our country to terrorists. Do you see how that makes no sense? Yeah. Okay, so that's an example of slippery slope thinking. Do you hear slippery slope thinking on TV all the time? Oh yeah, absolutely. Good way for media to get people engaged. Yeah, in other words, here's another one. We cannot elect Ronald Reagan. He is an actor. He has no political experience. Because he is an actor, if he ever gets his hands on those nuclear codes, he will have no idea what to do with them. He might accidentally press one of them and blow himself up and blow everybody up too. If we elect an actor as president, he may even lose the nuclear codes and accidentally give it to the president of China and they'll blow up the world. And yes, they actually did say this in, in a commercial about Ronald Reagan. And what does being an actor have to do with losing nuclear codes? So yes, slippery slope thinking can also be considered a non sequitur. It could be also considered fallacy of relevance. It, 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 it overlaps into all the other fallacies since the claim makes no sense, you see. And I remember um, in the 1960s, they did the same thing to, I forget which, which one it was, because my boyfriend gave me that example. They used the same example for, uh, this before my time. So I don't remember that one. But it's, it, this is an old trick. And they did it to Trump as well. Uh, th that's why when they said Trump is a, not, is, is a businessman, he will lose the nuclear codes. So this nuclear codes trope is very old. And according to, I remember the Ronald Reagan one. I don't remember the one from the 60s. That's going back a little too far. But he says that's when it started, okay? It was in the 60s. And they did it for, I think it was Johnson, maybe. I can look that up. Um, so uh, that is slippery slope thinking. A straw man fallacy occurs when someone takes another person's argument or point, distorts it or exaggerates it in some kind of extreme way, and then attacks the extreme distortion as if that is really the, the claim the first person is making. So in a straw man fallacy, politicians just, that's very similar to what I just said before. Politicians use this to deflect or dodge a sensitive question by changing the subject or distorting the, quest, distorting the answer in an exaggerated way that we lose track of the truth. So this can also be a non sequitur or a slippery slope fallacy. So person one would think, I think pollution from humans contributes to climate change. Oh, person two, so you think humans are directly responsible for extreme weather like hurricanes and have caused the droughts in southwestern U.S. If that's the case, maybe we just need to go to the southwest and perform a rain dance. So that makes no sense. What does rain dancing have to do with climate change or pollution? You see, so the end of this sentence needs to at least make sense to what your premise is. So when your premise makes no sense with your reason, that means you have a fallacy, okay? So that makes no sense. And so here you have another, the, the, the last fallacy. Yeah, this is the last fallacy. It's the appeal to fear fallacy. This type of fallacy is one that, as noted in its name, plays upon people's fears, in particular, this fallacy presents a scary future if a certain decision is made today. Elizabeth Smith doesn't understand foreign policy. If you elect Elizabeth Smith as president, we will be attacked by terrorists because all Elizabeth Smith understands is how to stay in fashion and she just knows how to get her hair just so. I'm not going to tell you which presidential candidate they were referring to. Um, president Biden or Trump does not understand foreign policy. You just stick in the name of somebody. Does not understand foreign policy. It is stick in the name, fault, 
that Putin attacked Ukraine because stick in the name made America look weak. And yes, both sides have blamed both the other side. That's why I've heard both. I've heard President Trump is at fault. I've heard that President Biden at, is at fault. But I think that Putin is at fault for Putin. You know, he decided he's going to invade, so he invaded. And everything else is just so much um, scuttlebutt, uh, yellow jet journalism, as it were. In other words, to get ratings, to get people riled up and angry. These days, that's how you get ratings. That's how you sell newspapers. And that's how you get people to click on clickbait. You got to get people angry. And that's why social media isn't good for you. Um, that's what, the, that's what the, I, I read. So in a nutshell, to avoid fallacies, arguments, you need to back up your claim with credible e evidence. Your argument needs to have ethos, pathos, and logos. You need to avoid bias by presenting both sides of an issue with credible evidence so that your paper is fair and balanced. If you do all of this, you will have, and this will fulfill the O in objective, and it will fulfill the ethos and in, 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 in logos in ethos, pathos, and logos. And here is a uh, chart you can use with your kids, because kids like looking at charts. Ad hominem, appeal to authority, bandwagon, begging the question, loaded question. And if you're going to teach this to your children, this means you have to know it yourself. That's how you learn it, is you teach it. Okay? That's how I really learned grammar, is because I had to teach the grammar over and over again to a lot of students. So uh, you can use this for to teach your kids, fifth grade and up. What grade are your kids? Well, I have two daughters in college and one in the 10th grade. So this is this one will go, go to the one in the 10th grade. Mm -hmm. And then the one in the 10th grade would say, hey, do you know about fallacies? I bet you don't. Ha, ha. That's what happened when uh, my friend taught her younger, her, her youngest child, she taught this media literacy that I was teaching in the class. And then when the youngest child went to na 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 na, do you, you know, to her older siblings, they had no clue because the mother had not gotten around to teaching the older ones yet. So you know that's what kids do. But anyway, uh, that's what my student told me. She was having, she was laughing about that. Anyway, um, ten common logical uh, what you call it, and then we have only two more weeks left to this class. And here is crap. Okay, here you. It's another way. Currency. When was the content written? When was it published? Has the content been updated? So this you can use with your kids, how to evaluate, uh, especially 10th grade, did, or did starting to do papers. Relevance, why are you reading this article? Does it deliver what it promises? Are the language and coverage appropriate? And then this relevance meaning, does, does it have credible sources? Does the uh, uh, thesis have uh, good reasoning? Uh, does it have uh, logos? Um, that sort of thing. Authority. Does this would be expert? Okay, this is this is the same thing. Does the author? This is ethos. Does the author have an academic degree in the field? Is the writer experienced enough? Does the writer use a systematic approach? Accuracy. This is a la Wikipedia. Has the author cited or not her sources? Are most of the sources scholarly or an academic, or are they from the National Enquirer and Wikipedia? Have the results of these studies been replicated? You're like, what? That's got to do with, is it a peer-reviewed article? Okay, so replicated means peer-reviewed. Purpose, what is the purpose of the article? That's got to do with the P in Kapow. Is it to inform? Is it an ad? Is it to sell you something? Any evidence of conflict of in interest or hidden agenda? Well, when you're, you're trying to sell something, obviously there is an agenda because you want to sell your product. So you'll say anything in order to have someone to get your commission. Uh, is the topic controversial, attracting biased treatment? So in other words, is it objective? So that's the O in Kapow. So you can also use crap as another way to tell if your, uh, your evidence is credible or if something is fallacious. So if it passes the crap test, then it's not a fallacy. If it's something credible, it's not a fallacy. And so if it's something credible and you have credible sources, then you avoid all of these, uh, you avoid all of these 
uh, fallacies. Because most of these fallacies occur is simply because you make a claim and you don't have evidence to back up your claim. Your evidence not logical. Your evidence assumes something that's not true. Uh, it has a false assumption where you assume is true without looking it up. Uh, stuff like that. Um, these are all that. That's basically what a fallacy is: an illogical argument. And there are hundreds of, actually there are hundreds of fallacies, and I've only gone over a few. I can think of two more, the false dilemma and false analogy. Like if I say, oh, you do this or else, and you give a person two choices, you either, um, you either uh, elect X or Z, or otherwise Y is going to happen, or something like that. That's a false dilemma, where you tell the person, only two things can happen, good or bad, and then boom, something's going to happen. And therefore, that's a false dilemma. Uh, either you do as I say, or I will divorce you. And if I divorce you, I'm taking all your money with me. That's a false dilemma, because there are other, other avenues in which he can, you know, uh, whatever it is. So when someone gives you a false dilemma, he's trying to manipulate you and, and become a drama queen. Okay, and um, I'm not going to say who it is, but some, somebody's in-law did that a lot to that person. But now that person is divorced, okay? But she was always manipulating him with false dilemmas. All the, and he didn't even realize it. And that's another thing, is people don't realize it because they get caught up in the drama of it all. So that is it. And uh, if I had a lot more students, I would ask all these, all these questions. <laughs> But I'm not going to ask, so since we're running uh, over, this is if I'm too, if I went fast and I'm under an hour, uh, then I would go over these questions. But these are good questions you can ask your kids, you see, so that after the, you do a shortened version of this, you can ask them, so, what do you remember of the fallacies? How do we avoid fallacies? Um, what are some examples of credible sources, non-credible sources? How do we use APA? Oh, one thing I forgot to say is we use APA to avoid plagiarism so that we credit the researcher for the years of research he puts into. How do you know all those numbers and statistics? And so that's why we use um, APA to avoid the plagiarism. A lot of plagiarism is unintentional plagiarism where the student simply didn't know they were supposed to uh, cite that source. So that's why I, I say over and over again, what, when do we use uh, APA? off the top of your head? Uh, when you have a direct quote, if you're using a date, if there's a historical fact, um, if there is uh, percentages or any kind of numbers involved, um, then what else was there? Historical, medical, uncommon. Medical, medical and uncommon, yep. So, so, so. so if, you, if, you, if, you, if you say any, in any kind of any scientific fact, like the ocean wave is caused by the moon, that would be a scientific fact. That also is, you have to uh, cite the source. I have to remember to put that as scientific. The, the ocean wave, did you know that the ocean wave is caused by the different phases of the moon? Yes. And how the moon pulls on the waves and that sort of thing. I, as a kid, I thought that was fascinating, um, mm -hmm. along with dinosaurs. So there you go. <laughs> Um, and so the week in the week 12, uh, uh, week 11 lecture, I'm going to talk about what is a science paper. First, I'm going to go over the, the rough draft. Everyone's week 11 uh, rough draft. I have, to, I have to go over what is revision and proofreading and week 11 because that's part of your syllabus. And then I'm going to go over how to do a science paper and how to read scholarly sources. So that makes it long. And so. Um, Let's see. Do you have any questions? Uh, no, not at this point. Did do you think I? A lot I, to absorb. <laughs> a lot to absorb. Yeah. yeah. Did you Did you enjoy the lecture? Yes, absolutely. It was uh, quite helpful with regards to you know. What are you Are you done. Are you going to teach this to your one remaining kid? Oh yeah, I am certainly going to talk to him about it because he. He loves to look up things. So. Yeah, he probably got that from from you, right? Looking up things. Yes, he likes to research things just like me. So yeah. Social social media is not. I I was just looking over TikTok. It was my very first time looking at TikTok just mm -hmm. yesterday, and I was like, Ugh, gross. Not not my scene. Yeah. It's, it's a, that's what young people like. 
<laughs> oh, hey, you know, it's, you know, my, my cousin's daughter posts uh, her dances on TikTok, but you really have to, I mean, she, he allows his daughters to look at that. I'm like, I wouldn't, but I guess because all the kids are, see, and that's peer, that's peer pressure, bandwagon fallacy. Just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean you're supposed to be doing it mm -hmm. because that is an appeal to emotion. Yet, even though we know about this, we still do it. Correct. Correct. Because you we get are caught all, up in it. You get caught up in it. That's correct. Mm -hmm. If you look at the shopping channel, they're like, everyone else has bought this. You should buy it too. We only have two more left. Two more minutes. So if you watch the shopping channel, it's all one big bandwagon fallacy. Mm -hmm. Funny, But it's still fun to watch as everybody <laughs> scrambles to buy this worthless, worthless t piece of tin that, that you know, whatever. So it, it, it's fun to watch. Other people look dumb on the shopping channel. Anyway, so uh, if you have no more questions, I will call, I will um, see you for week 11 lecture next week. So same bat time and same bat place. All right, thank you. Almost done. Almost done with this class. <laughs> Two more weeks.